So the first thing I wanted to say, uh, you, you know there's a new voice at the Ford Foundation if you just click on their annual report. Now, annual report's not something I generally think, oh gosh, can't wait to read that, read that latest annual report. But I promise you, if you click on the Ford Foundation's annual report, you will see a series of conversations and essays that suddenly open the door uh, to, or, or to the, the world that Ford is funding and thinking about. And one of the things you've been thinking about is really um, what's wrong with philanthropy, which is an interesting place for uh, the head of the second largest foundation in the country to start. Uh, and you recently, you have an essay uh, in, in, that's coming out in Civicus where you say that philanthropy has abandoned nonprofits through incremental project-focused giving. Now, as the president of a, we see lots of people nodding around here, right? As the president of a think tank and civic enterprise, absolutely, right? I, we, there's all this tightly, tightly, tightly focused project giving, but I thought that was the best way to get results. Well, first, thank you, Emery, for being here, and thanks to all of you um, for coming. Um, and I certainly am not as interesting or charismatic as Cory Booker, but I'm happy to talk about <laughs> philanthropy and to congratulate uh, you and your colleagues at New America. Of course, Ford has enjoyed a long and very productive partnership with you, and having you at the helm only, I think, emboldens us to do more. Your, your I think, observation about my annual letter in some ways is a good starting point because it was a starting point for me. I have never been president of a foundation, and when I became president, I was presented uh, with a communication that was to come from the president, and it, it was incredibly generic, and it sounded like a lot of um, CEOs' communications. It sounded like it was really about managing risk rather than actually telling what's going on at the foundation. So um, we, my communications team and I came to an understanding that they <laughs> need, that um, my voice has to be what actually leads and the way I talk and the way I am and my lived experience, I need to bring that up to my communication and, and therefore it probably does sound a little different and, and that's by design because I think being authentic is what we need to be and sometimes um, that's a little uncomfortable for people but it, it's not for me. Um, <laughs> Your point about my essay in Civicus is, it is true. I, I do say that we are project funding nonprofits to death, because we are. And, um, and what I mean and what I talk about in that essay is what we have to do in philanthropy to get back to uh, the thing I call the three eyes that we have done over 50 years at Ford, and that really is investing in institutions, investing in ideas, and investing in individual leaders, and that we start there, and then we figure out strategy. Um, but, but the how we do it, the thing we know about social change and social progress, in, certainly in the United States and anywhere in the world, is that you have to have those three things. You have to have institutions that are durable and that over the long haul are going to be fortified for the fight because certainly what we do, social justice work, is a contested idea. The very idea of social justice is contested and so therefore to do it effectively over many, many years requires institutions, requires leaders, and requires ideas. And we don't do that by doing project funding. It is very important that we do project funding because there is a role. I just simply believe that, that we need to recalibrate things. And, and that's going for forward to mean, um, I think in some ways, some radical change in our own behavior. It also will mean that we will be in some ways more rigorous about making grants and it may lead to fewer grants, to fewer grantees. So the news isn't good for everyone, and it isn't about making everyone happy. It is about saying if we are really going to be investing in institutions, that means we're gonna give more general support, 
We're going to give more um, uh, adherence to what our grantee partners believe should be strategy rather than sitting in our wonderful glass house and coming up with it and then sort of telling people as contractors to please go and do this for us. Wow. So one of the things interesting about the way you talk about it is that's the pendulum swinging back to a model that you might now call the old philanthropy. I mean, the philanthropy that I came up with when you know, I was a student and running, program, running a program at Harvard, it was much more about you know, investing in individual leaders or in institutions. And as I said, I, I think it makes wonderful sense. But it's very, it's very much at variance with what we might, might now call the new philanthropy. So all the new money uh, that is, these huge amounts of new money, that is being spent often in a way uh, that invests in uh, sometimes for-profit and sometimes not-for-profit, but very tightly constrained because these are investments. So when, when one of the new uh, foundations or, or the various uh, individuals who have this kind of money, they're, they're in many ways you know, tightening the strings and asking, like, we're investing and this is what we expect to see for our investment and this is round one and this is round two. So talk a little bit about the differences between the old and the new philanthropy and are there bridges and where you see Ford uh, in between them? Well, I think it's unfortunate in some ways that we have allowed this dichotomization of philanthropy to occur where some of us who are what are called legacy foundations and newer <laughs> foundations seem to be pitted against each other. Um, some of that critique is because there are people in both communities who um, look disfavorably, uh, unfavorably at the other um, as arrogant, um, and that is on both sides. People. The new philanthropy say that the old philanthropy is arrogant, and the old philanthropy says the new philanthropy is arrogant. <laughs> and, and so we, we get into this false dichotomy, be, because I actually think that much of the new philanthropists are doing amazing, important work and are innovating in some really phenomenally important ways. We just shouldn't allow the discourse to become so dominated by a singular theology of what philanthropy ought to be. And that's always what we get into. We, we, we either the media or the philanthropy bloggers or there's always someone because it's a much sexier thing to have good and bad. I mean, it, it, the complexity of our current ecosystem is uh, often uh, uh, frustrating uh, to journalists and pundits. You know, it's just like when <laughs> there was the Cold War era and there was, Russia was bad and America was good. The world was far more easy to explain. Um, and, and it was far more easier to know what was right, wrong, good, bad. And so putting us into the di that dichotomy where we become bad because we're old and be is, I just think, a disservice. So, But I also would say that m many of the new philanthropists have learned what we legacy institutions and our donors knew, which is just because Henry Ford could innovate and build a Model T, he didn't actually think he could fix the school systems. And, and, and so, and so <laughs> John D. Anybody Rockefeller. Anybody tweeting, that's a tweet. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, John D. Rockefeller, his, the efficiency he brought to the production of oil transformed our economy, but John D. Rockefeller understood and had the humility to know that actually he needed help and needed to listen to people who knew better and who understood the problems that he wanted to help solve. And he listened to them <laughs> and he invested in them and he was guided by their wisdom. He did not impose or, or appropriate from his business experience a sense that what you need to do is what I did to be successful in running my business enterprise. So I'm inviting you right now to have the same conversation in six months in Silicon Valley. So we're, we will. <laughs> I'm there. 
we're going to do this. So, with that, so you anticipate my next question because one of the biggest differences in, in the, I agree, it's a false dichotomy and it may be an unproductive dichotomy, but one of it is, look, the, the new money believes the private sector can do it all, right? Or the private sector and the civic sector, but we can just leave government out of it. We, we can set up our own schools, we can uh, figure out how to solve public problems, because that's what really, that's what New America tries to do, that's what Ford tries to do, uh, that, that's what, what lots and lots of, of individuals are trying to do. Talk a little more about how you see government and the, the way, the relationship between philanthropy and government and the civic sector, because that's a very big set of questions in a world that's so complex, many of us think, well, you know, you need all three, but then what are the relations between them? Well, it's interesting. I, this morning, spoke at a panel uh, that was an international group, and one of the questions from the editor of the FT was, do you believe that the emergence of non-state actors really portends the future of development, yeah. that, that the state in international affairs will become less important because there are all these non-state actors and cities are important and civil society, et cetera, and the private sector. And I, I think that it is really naive to believe that we can have progress with weak and ineffective government and that non-state actors can fill the void, particularly in a democracy, of of governance and addressing uh, the issues of how to build the public commons, how to address issues like inequality, um, how to have policies that incent uh, investment and incent philanthropy. All of these questions are deeply affected by the quality of governance. And so to simply believe uh, and in, in a sort of adherence that the private markets can solve these problems. There are many things the private markets can solve and we should incent their solution building. But if we do that without also taking account and attention to governance, uh, we do it at our own peril and it won't be sustained because at the end of the day, you've gotta have government helping to sustain. So you were hugely important in helping to resolve Detroit's pension crisis. Uh, and it, I, I'm interested how there, so you and Knight and a couple of other foundations, you, know, you are private foundations who are coming in to work with a city uh, in, in a, exactly a city that's been very badly governed. How does, how does it work in practice where you're putting in funds, but obviously you want to see that city better governed? How, how, do, how do you actually put that into practice? Well, first of all, in, in the grand bargain, which is what the solution, um, the ultimate transaction was called, um, wasn't my idea, but whatever. <laughs> um, the, the, you played a huge the, role, the, let me put it that way. The, the, the role that I played was, was when, when the court, the, the chief mediator uh, presented the court's plan to a group of foundations, which was that we would fund the entire effort. Uh, I mean, I think I did play a role in being really clear that that was simply <laughs> a non-starter um, and that there was a role for so, government there you go. And, that, and that ultimately government had to be engaged in this solving this problem and long-term monitoring the pensions and monitoring the, 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 the conditions that ensure that the contracts we would be entering into would, would, would be honored. So in that instance, I think what, what philanthropy did was to really um, ensure that government was accountable. Uh, and, and I think in the case of, of Detroit, the governor who is a Republican governor and who put much of his own political capital at risk because no one in his and his caucus and his party wanted uh, in the legislature in Lansing to save Detroit. I mean, there was no uh, support from um, senior people in his party at the state level uh, for the plan. And he, he literally 
um, ensured that the state matched the $400 million that, that we raised. And, and that is a huge That's... tribute to him and his a kind of leadership that is not ideological and that is about, I'm here to problem solve for the people. That is, as you're talking, I'm thinking, I'm wearing my foreign policy hat and I'm thinking, it, you just describe domestic development, right? You just oh, describe absolutely. what normally happens in international development, which is in, money comes in from outside, from foundations or from government agencies, and says, we will give you this money, but we're going to monitor how well you govern. And we think of that all the time if we're talking about various countries in Africa and Asia. Absolutely. You just described it uh, well, in Michigan. <laughs> because, it, because we know that in our own country, we have our own global south. Absolutely. And, and there are many, unfortunately, global souths in America. And, and many of the lessons we have learned through our work, actually, we, we can interpolate from them a lot to deal with some of the conditions locally. I love that, many global Souths in America. Um, so let me, now let me look at the other side of the street. So this question you got asked this morning where, you know, does government have a role to play in development? One of the things, the other, the, there's a commitment to the private sector, but there's also a commitment to social enterprise, right? To using pri the market forces for social purposes. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, you know, lots of new uh, foundations, individuals investing a lot in social enterprise. I wanted to ask you what you thought, and particularly to talk about Ford's own role in program-related investments sure. and helping so the whole uh, social enterprise sector to develop. Well, I think when I talk about the three eyes, the, you know, I, the ideas is about ideas and innovation. And, and I, I'm very proud of the fact that I think Ford has, has very much been about social innovation for many years. And so, Along the way, I mean, I was a product of one of the Ford social innovations. I was in the first class of Head Start. Well, Head Start was so an early 1960s grant from the Ford Foundation to a group of social scientists at Yale because there was so little understanding of how to help poor children in terms of early childhood development. And, 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 and to help, their, uh, help, their, help us uh, get off to a good educational start. Well, that was a real innovation. Head Start was an innovation. And when I look back over the history, the arc of Ford, and I think about all the things that we helped to seed from public broadcasting to the NEA and the NEH, all the way through all kinds of things like community development in the international arena, so many international programs, and, and all the way through giving Mohammed Yunus his first, Yunus his first grant and, and, and creating Grameen Bank, and then moving into future work all the way more recently to, to work uh, around domestic policy uh, and, and domestic workers, uh, and as you know well here, internet rights, yes. uh, which is a, a, a important program that you have here, uh, and my colleague Lori McGlinty is here, who manages that portfolio at Ford with, with you. Um, the Open Technology Institute is an example of an innovation, the idea that we in philanthropy, if we care about social change, we have to care about the internet. Now, there are so few people who even understand the internet. No one who runs a foundation is a digital native or anywhere close. There, <laughs> there are very few people in foundations who are comfortable with technology. And yet, the internet is going to be and already is the primary battleground in our society for opportunity. And yet, those of us who are entrusted with, with fighting for more opportunity, fighting for access, ensuring fairness and a more just society are completely AWOL on this issue. And, and that's the sort of thing as a matter of, of, of continuing to innovate and adapt and change that we in philanthropy have to get better at. And certainly we at Ford, because I will tell you, we need to innovate more. <laughs> and uh, there are many of our practices that are calcified and that need to change and that were appropriate and great in the past. No critique, but as a matter of going forward, we need to make some changes. 
So one of the things, thinking about uh, internet policy, right? We've just had the net neutrality uh, struggle and victory, uh, f uh, and obviously with your help, New America played a very important Absolutely. role. But one of the things that struck me, we've written lots of reports uh, and uh, <laughs> you know, lots of blog posts, et cetera. The thing that probably had the biggest impact, certainly in my household, on net neutrality was John Oliver. Right? Uh, <laughs> it was extraordinary. You watched John Oliver and then suddenly you understood uh, why net neutrality was important. So I, one of the things you did uh, at Ford before becoming president was exactly to work in these less traditional policy spaces uh, or less traditional spaces for bringing about change generally, using the arts, using different yeah. kinds of media. And I, wonder, I wanted to ask you about how you see that going forward? Uh, are we, are we, are there more options for us to make social change, to solve public problems uh, in ways that we haven't tapped enough? Absolutely. So the John Oliver vignette that you just, it was all about culture, understanding that to change hearts and minds, to educate people, you have to understand their cultural context. And in development, I remember at Rockefeller, my first meeting uh, with a group of the ag science, which is what they were called, the ag science guys, uh, who did the food security work. Oh, yeah. uh, there was, it was a really brilliant conversation as a set of presentations about food security in, in some African countries, but it was completely devoid of any cultural specificity. It was, a set of ideas that seemingly were, were constructed at, at Iowa A&M and Cornell and those grantees, and then, well, let's transport those to, to Uganda. And, and I think we've learned that. I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the dirt roads in rural villages and the streets of urban slums are filled with the carcasses of development programs that died because no one understood culture. Yeah. And so one of the reasons I'm excited, and you may have read because I, I posted something this week, I, I spoke last week, I did the keynote at the um, Jeff Skoll's Forum at, at Oxford, and I talked about this question of art, culture, uh, development, activism, and, and so we are going to be looking at that intersection of how we use culture for storytelling because we know that people's perceptions uh, and their ability to absorb uh, knowledge, information, and to determine their, uh, their viewpoint is often not, well, in fact, we know, the neuroscience tells us actually the facts are not, are not <laughs> more than 50%. The, the fact is less than 50% exactly. of a person's, um, uh, uh, the, the, the part of the brain that processes the fact has less influence on the outcome of a person's perception than a host of other inputs. Absolutely. Culture is the primary. And, and so whether we're working on ending child marriage, which if you're working on ending child marriage or FGM, you don't start by talking about a UN report or, or appropriating some culturally specific thing that a group of feminists in the United States believe ought to be the storyline. You start by, in the village, asking the carriers of the culture, how do we change your tribe, your communities, views on whether women should be subjected to this kind of torture. How do we change that? That's how we start, but we, that hasn't been the way we've operated for most of our history. Yeah, it's so interesting, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, I love StoryCorps on oh, NPR. I just love it, you know, you, you listen to it, and it, it, you know, the small towns across America, Absolutely. People talking to each other in ways they don't, parents and children. And I found myself thinking, imagine if you made it possible for villages across the, the, around the world to 
tell their own stories, you know, to, to, be, to do something that we as Americans just take for granted. We have multiple ways we can do this. And, and that's, that's the repository of culture. It's mapping your own Absolutely. world. It's creating the archives of your own culture and history. And, and it's so far from how we, how we think about Well, but it's also, if you talk to Dave Icey, who, the founder of, of, of StoryCorps, who was in my office a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying how frustrating it is for him because what funders want to know is, Give us your metrics. That was my um, Tell me, uh, so it's great, I heard, I was crying, I heard the story, I was in the bathroom getting ready and I was crying, and, I, and all those things that StoryCorps does. Right. But show me your metrics. I want outcomes, and I want them in three year sort Absolutely. of. And, and I think that's one of the real challenges today is that as our society has become so, uh, as we've moved, as I think the Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel gets it so right when he says we have moved from being a market economy to a market society where the only things that matter are things that can be measured and things that have a relationship with capital. So if it can't be measured, then maybe it doesn't matter. And if it can't be monetized, then maybe we shouldn't care about it. And I think that's the most insidious thing that is happening in our culture. And that is also producing this other challenge we have in our culture, which is sort of short-termism, which is our enemy, which is, which is so uh, in, in, infested our every sort of fiber of who we are as a people now. And it, it so distorts um, our decision-making, our priorities, what matters, um, and so, in every aspect of our lives. And as, as parents, I know this whole, you know, raising children in an era where it's all about immediacy and I wanna pay off now, I want the benefit now. Well, they're only mimicking the patterns that they see yeah. adults. Um, and so whether it's an investor on Wall Street, whether it's a, a school district that wants to turn around tomorrow, whatever it may be, there is, there is this sense that um, we need to measure it or it doesn't matter, and we want to see results now. So that's my last question, because I was exactly going to go there, which was to say, so you reject the, the, the just ter terribly confining and narrowing uh, emphasis on those kinds of metrics, but at the same time, you're all about impact, right? The Absolutely. Ford Foundation is about impact. So give us your vision of how a foundation re connects to its grantees in a way that creates impact but does not confine to the point that you undercut the very wonderful work you want to support. So I like to think that at the Ford Foundation, we are in the business of hope. And when you're in the business of hope, and justice, you don't start with a demand for metrics. You start with an understanding that in a democracy like the United States, for example, the narrative arc of our history should inform how we think about progress, which is that it is slow, long slog, really hard, and particularly on issues that are about real core root cause challenges in our culture, race, gender, class, geography, all of these things, yes, we make progress and we should measure that progress, but at the end of the day, we have to be committed to the struggle and the journey. And if I were to look back over our work, whether it be our early grants to to educate the world about South Africa, apartheid, going back to the 50s, or our early work on racial justice in the US, it absolutely, by the perspective of an evaluation, that work could have been killed at many points over those years. Um, there were times in, in the, the, the funding of our work in South Africa where we were at odds with our own government because the United States government said that Mandela and Oliver Tambo and that they were all enemies of the state. And yet we made grants to support 
their disciples traveling the world to proselytize about the evils of apartheid. When I look at our work supporting the civil rights movement, we, the Ford Motor Company, was livid about the work. Henry Ford wrote the most unkind letter to, <laughs> to Mac George Bundy, admonishing him for the harm we were doing to the very thing that made us the Ford Foundation, which is the Ford Motor Company, because the dealers in the American South were so displeased by our activism and the, what we were supporting, which was harming their business in the South. And yet, we had to continue to do it. So of course, by many objective standards, it would have been possible to say, stop it. This is a failed idea. You're pushing the envelope too much. Go find something else that is less high risk and less controversial to fund. And I'm really proud that we didn't do that. And so today, yes, we, whenever we can run a randomized control trial, like we're doing on our conditional cash transfer program in Latin America, let's do an RCT. It's the appropriate metric. But we're not going to run an RCT on our racial justice program. Because guess what? We haven't solved it yet. And in order to solve it, we've got to be on the journey for the long haul. That's what we're about. I told you, Darren Walker is a visionary. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.